The South African government borrowed an additional 562.6 billion rand in the 2020 fiscal year ended March 2021. That drove the national stock of debt listed on the JSC to hit 3.8 trillion rand, down from 3.2 trillion rand in the fiscal year ended March 2020. This was revealed in the National Treasury's annual debt management report released for the 2020 fiscal year. Government debt accounts for 74.5% of total debt, which is also taken out by state-owned entities and private corporations, among others. 2020 was the year that COVID-19 wreaked havoc on the local economy and also coincided with ratings agency Moody's downgrading the country's sovereign credit to junk. In the year 2020, the local economy contracted by 6.4%, a major factor that placed government finances under major pressure. In a year like um, the year that we had, um, which was affected by COVID, economic activity affected by COVID, that had an impact both on tax revenue, companies were not as profitable as they were, tax revenue was lower, but also it had an impact on expenditure. We had certain expenditure commitments as a result of the COVID pandemic. So the combination of lower revenue and higher expenditure means you have a higher deficit. That you have to that you have to finance and that you have to borrow for, and hence that component of your gross borrowing requirement would then be much larger. The World Economic Forum has launched the Global Risk Report. The findings stem from the canvassing of over 12,000 leaders globally on what they perceive as key risks. The report also focuses on specific countries, including South Africa. Well, to give us some insights from the report, I'm joined by Sadia Zahidi. She's a managing director at the World Economic Forum. Thank you very much for joining us, Sadia. Now, what are the key risks, short term and longer term, that leaders in the world are worried about right now? So we first asked people how they're feeling about um, the global outlook. And the bad news is 84% of people are either worried or concerned, and only 4% of people are optimistic about the outlook. But at the same time, I think we can pull apart why that is happening and what some of the trends are. So in the next couple of years, the big concerns are a loss of social cohesion, jobs and livelihood-related crises, mental health deterioration, and at the same time, concerns about extreme weather events um, that are also unfolding at the same time. Then if you look two to five years out, that's where some of the risks become also a bit more economic. There's concern around um, asset prices. There's concern around uh, potential uh, you know, cybersecurity uh, threats. And then if you look further out over the next 10 years or so, it's very clear. It's climate, climate, climate. That's what the world is incredibly worried about. Hmm, indeed, a, a long-term risk that we should be working towards uh, mitigating in terms of climate change now. But looking at South Africa specifically, we're aware, of course, in the country that we have many challenges. Some argue that our biggest crisis is unemployment. What were some of the key risks identified by your report? Yeah, so looking specifically at concerns in South Africa in the short term, so that's over the next year out, prolonged economic stagnation, um, big concerns around employment and livelihoods, um, concerns around um, the, the state and, and how that is faring, concerns around public infrastructure, and then, of course, proliferation of, of crime and illicit activity. So those are the kinds of very domestic concerns that came through. And I think that's one case in point of what is happening across countries around the world. There is a deep inward focus at the moment in many, many economies, given the multitude of crises that we have to deal Deal with, not least the pandemic. And yet at the same time, if we look out at the global risks that we're all collectively facing as humanity, it's very clear that those are the ones that are going to require crossing borders and working closely in cooperation with our neighbors. Mm. And that's really the key tension point that emerges from the report. So you make reference to the erosion of social cohesion. Uh, perhaps you can unpack that a little bit for us. And does that seem to be a global phenomenon? 
It is. It is the number one risk that our respondents identified as having worsened in the last two years. And I think we see evidence of that around us. There are many countries around the world where there is a jobs crisis, whether that is the great resignation or whether that is simply very high unemployment, people not being able to find a job to begin with. Underneath it, an education and skills related crisis that the world is also facing. Mental health is deteriorating. For example, 53 million additional cases of just depression alone, not to mention other uh, mental health um, issues that have been rising because of the pandemic. So coming together, all of that is leading to a lot of youth disillusionment, a lot of societal strife, a lot of social polarization. And underneath it, what we can see clearly as an outcome is a growing divide when it comes to income, not just globally, not only a growing fracture between the advanced economies and the developing world, but also within societies. Many of the, the richest um, in the world, in most societies, have been able to recuperate their losses from the last couple of years. And yet, according to the World Bank, the 50, the, the lowest 20% earners around the world have further lost another 5% of their income. So it's very, very clear that when it comes to jobs, income, health, mental health, education, there is a growing fact, fracture. And it is further perpetuated by the lack of um, internet services for 3.6 billion people in the world. And that is going to be key to be able to give them future livelihood, future education, future skills. So in conclusion, what needs to happen? Do systems need to change? Or is it back to the point that you made earlier that really globally people need to cooperate more in order to uh, deal with some of these risks that you're talking about? So I think it's both. We will need to have a lot more global cooperation, and that is especially visible when it comes to the distribution of vaccines. That is especially visible when it comes to um, uh, making the changes that are required to manage for climate change. But it is also incredibly important that countries learn from each other when it comes to their domestic concerns. There are solutions, there are new technologies, there are new ways of doing things, new policy experiments that are happening around the world where I think we would all fare a whole lot better if we were learning from each other's experiments. And as much as the report is pointing to all of the concerns that exist on both the domestic and the global agenda, it's also very clear that there are solutions and those solutions will require more sharing of evidence and more collaboration. Hmm. Sadia Zahidi, thank you very much for your time, ma'am. She's the Managing Director at the World Economic Forum.